How does the Magid do Magid? What is the, you know, Rabbi Pesach Kron, who is who's the Magid, an incredible, incredible storyteller with who has devoted his life to really creating and, and collecting all of these incredible, incredible stories to give over tremendous inspiration to, to all of Qal Yisrael. How does he run his Seder? And the reason I'm asking this question is because stories are the most one of the most impactful ways to give over an, an inspiring message to, to anyone. And on the Seder night, we have an incredible opportunity as parents to really, really give over tremendous meaning, tremendous, you know, the Nesiv Shalom says that the Seder night is the Rosh Hashanah for Emuna, and we have an incredible opportunity. So how do we do that? Perhaps we can do that with stories. And tonight we have an incredible opportunity to hear from Rabbi Pesach Kron, how he does Magid, how he, and not just Magid, but throughout the Seder, to, to give us stories, to give us really practical stories to use in our own storm, and as well, really pro tips from the the Magid. How how can parents become, you know, somewhat professional storytellers on the night of the Seder? So uh, without further ado, enjoy this episode. Raising children in general is not easy. Throw in the desire to have passion and committed Jews. Now that's next level hard. With weekly episodes on our parenting hierarchy, you will find the answers to your biggest parenting questions and gain the best practices you need to raise the children the way you want, to raise the Jews next door. Yashikoch, Rabbi, Rabbi Kron, thank you so much. Thank for, you, Rabbi, for, time. Time for this wonderful, wonderful opportunity. And uh, I think that the key to making a Seder successful and the key to reaching children is one word, prepare. If you don't prepare, it's not going to happen. Nothing happens, even a speech, any speech that I give. I never ad lib. I never speak without notes. And I never speak without preparing. It's rare that I will accept a speaking engagement 10 minutes before I'm speaking. I always have notes, I always prepare, and I always, always check out the stories because kids and adults can tell if you're just adding things that really were not part of the story. So mm -hmm. what you've got to do, one, prepare, two, get a great story that you think is meaningful. If you don't mm -hmm. think it's meaningful, it's not going to go over. When they say, Dvarim hayyitzim in alev, nechnosim la'alev, that's the key. Dvarim hayyitzim in alev. Every story that I've ever printed in any of the books, I always have this in mind. This story could somebody, could be someone's favorite story in the book. In other words, it's not going to be everybody's favorite story, but it's going to be so powerful that somebody someplace, whether it's Dallas or Israel or Canada or New York, Somebody someplace is going to think, now that's worth the whole book. And mm -hmm. you never know what's going to hit people. But like I say, preparation is involved, and you have to check out the story and not overburden with facts that have no relation to the story. And that's why people fall asleep when people are speaking or telling stories, because you're just going off on a tangent. So let me give you a simple example. Before we get into the story. actual stories. How, besides for the preparation and besides for finding, a, you know, a story that really, really speaks to them, are there any other components to storytelling that a parent, that you would advise a parent as to how they can really become, you know, a storyteller on this night to give over? Because also this whole night is about Sipuri and Sipuri, I'm giving over the story of, uh, you know, besides for just the stories that, you know, we'll add in tonight, but also the, the Sipor in general. So both the Sipor and the stories that, that, you know, you're going to provide us with. How, any other tips that a parent, uh, you know, how can it, how can parent make it more captivating and exciting for their for their children and anyone who's at their seder to listen to? It's a good question. I don't know that I have a secret to it. What I would try to do is follow the order of the Haggadah, and as I say, as you're preparing, um, think about what this part of the Haggadah means to you personally in your own personal life of what your experiences are. And everybody, everybody loves to hear what's going on in your life. People are nosy. And, you know, if you're telling stories about somebody else, that's one thing. But when you tell a story about yourself or how you view something, you know, that's really incredible. 
Now, let me just give you a small example that this is something that you could start the Seder with and maybe before Kiddush even, just to tell him what the meaning of the word Pesach is. And I'll give you a great story and a lesson that everybody in the family can relate to. And you'll see how my own family relates to this. What does the word Pesach mean? Most people think it means to pass over. That's not what Rashi says it means. And that's not what the Targum says it means. And you'll be very, very surprised because if you look at the Pusik where it says, Va'amartem Zevach Pesach, Hulashem Asher Pesach, Al Bote B'nei Yisrael. Now look it up. It's in Shemois Yudbe's Pusik of Zion. Asher Pesach, Al Bote B'nei Yisrael. You know what the Targum says on that? Chos Hashem Ad Rachmanus. The word Pesach means to have compassion, to have Rachmanus. And Rashi says also in Shemois Yud Bey's Pesach of Gimel that when it says, Uposach Hashem ala Pesach, Rashi says, V'chomal, Hashem had Rachmanus. Now, all of a sudden, that gives us a different idea of what Pesach is all about. Now, I grew up in Kew Gardens, Queens. There were not too many Jewish kids playing baseball with me when I grew up. So the Goyim... They couldn't say Pesach. They called me Passover, right? <laughs> because that's what everybody thinks that Pesach is. But that's not the only meaning of Pesach. Pesach is compassion. So let me tell you a story about compassion, and you'll see how we can apply it to ourselves. We know that in the previous generation, didn't die that long ago, Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Orbach was the God of Hador, the great Tzaddik of the generation. And he had a nephew named Michal, and he called his son, his nephew, Michal, a couple of days before Yantav, and he said, I want you to come to my house right after you burn the hummus. And he said, Uncle, you know, that's a very busy day, Arab I can't do what you need me to do before Yantav, a couple of days before. No, you have to come after you burn the hummus. I've got a job for you to do. Okay, it's his uncle, it's the God Lador. Of course he came. He comes to the house after he burns the hummus. And he sees Rav Shlomo Zalman has 10 envelopes on the table. They are all sealed, all addressed, name and address. And he says to his nephew, Michal, I want you to go and give these out to these people. Now, this Michal, he knew some of these people. He knew they were very poor and he had already raised money for some of these families. So he said to his uncle, I recognize some of these names. I've given them money already for Yantif. He says, don't ask me questions. Just go and do what I tell you. So he ran out and he started delivering the envelopes. But the first five, he did very quickly. Then he saw he was doing well. So he decided by the sixth guy, he's going to wait to see when the guy opens it up. And he says, you know, this is from my uncle, the God of Hadar, and he opens up the envelope and Michal could not believe what was in there. It was not only some cash, but there were tickets to the biblical zoo. Now, in Yerushalayim, there's a zoo that has animals, rare animals that are mentioned in the Torah. And many people go to visit those animals. It's like the Bronx Zoo that we would have in New York, but a different type. But basically, it's a zoo. This Michal could not believe that's what Rav Shleim Zalman is giving out, Erev Yantif. And he goes to the next house, the seventh house, and it's the same thing. Each envelope had cash and tickets to the biblical zoo. Now, Michal had no time to go back to Rav Shlomo Zalman and ask him what the intent was here. So he finished, he delivered, and he went, you know, he had Yandif. First day, Cholomite, he goes to his uncle and he says, you've got to explain this. Why was it so important to give them tickets to the biblical zoo and cash right before Yantif? Listen to what he said. Rav Shlomo Zalman said, I know the children in Yerushalayim. I know during Dalvin, they're going to be talking and they're going to be talking to each other. And one is going to ask the other, you know, do you have a trip planned? Are you going to any place with your parents? And mm. most of the kids will say they have someplace where they're going. But these poor kids will have nothing. They'll have nothing to say because their parents can't afford to take them any place. And they're going to ruin not only their own yantif, but they're going to go home and complain to their parents. And that, they're going to ruin the parents' yantif. I just wanted to make sure that every kid would have someplace that he could go to. Now that's compassion. Who thinks like that? Only a great person. But I'll tell you something, what I want to say to all the parents, and this is what you should be doing this Cholomite. If you are taking a trip, whether you're going to a Yankee game, a Met game, 
Great Adventure, Six Flags. Take some kid from the neighborhood who can't afford to go. Take some kid from your child's class. That's what we did. Every time my wife and I went on vacation with the children, we always took one child from their class that we knew could not afford to go to the Poconos or could not go to the Homewack, Oliver Shalom, if you remember the Homewack, or could wow. not go to even Jacksonville did, where my mother lived. How did your lived. children feel about having someone else in their like family time, their family vacation? Well, that's a good question. You've got to get somebody that's very close to them. That is a very, very good point. But if if you find children like that, now I can tell you, I remember I was once in Australia by the Herzog family. And the family told me about this Mr. Herzog, who was a wonderful man, a very wealthy man. Every time he went shopping before Yontif, he always took a kid from one of his son's classes or the wife would take from the door and buy them a dress for Yontif that they couldn't afford or buy them shoes or buy them a hat. That's what the Yontif of Pesach is all about. O Pesach Hashem had Rachmanes on the Yidden. And then we can bring this in a practical way. Cholomai. We're all taking trips. Okay, this year Cholomite comes out, Shabbos is in the middle, so kind of cuts down the trips that we could take. But whatever you're doing, and Rabbi Menchel has a very good point. Don't take a kid in the class that your children will feel uncomfortable with. That's very important. You want them to feel that they have special family time. And I would say you don't have to take them on all the trips, but at least one trip. That's a chinuch for the children. That's what Pesach is all about. And I think if you tell the children the story, and I'll tell you another great story about Rachmanus, as we'll see in a moment. All of a sudden, it opens up their eyes. That's what Pesach is. It's not only matzah and moror and wine and haroises and moror and all. That's, of course, that's important. But Pesach is Rachmanus. Just- also, if you give over that story on the first night or on the second night, then when you get to Chol you can, you can, you can, as you're bringing in that friend, you can relate exactly. back to that story and be like, remember... We're actually going and doing that. We're having that Rachman. It's like right, really but nice. You don't say it in front of the kid that you're bringing. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, listen to this great story. It's, it's incredible. After the Second World War, there were many, many people who had survived the war. And the Skalena Rebbe, Rabbi Lieza Zisha, Portugal, you can look it up on Google. You'll see his history. He was a great Sadiq. And he came back to Bukovina in Romania. And in Bukovina, he wanted to get some matzah. So he had a chassid go out and they got some uh, wheat and they were able to grind it and make some flour. The chassid's name was Fischl Kerpel. I just want to mention his name. It should be a schus for his neshama. And he, they were able to make some flour and they were able to make some matzahs. And he announced that any rabbonim that were, that had survived and come to Bukovina, he would give them three matzahs for the Seder. So people started coming. Now, a little boy, an eight-year-old boy, now he told me the story. So this is first-hand information, except the eight-year-old boy was 70 when he told me the story, and he was a Rebbe himself, the Sarah Vishnitzer Rebbe. I called him a Haifa because I wanted to check out the story. So he told me as an eight-year-old, he went to the Skalana Rebbe, and he said, I'm the son of the Sarah Vishnitzer Rebbe. And he sends warm regards and the Skalera Rebbe kissed his head and said, your father's so special. Here's three matzahs. He said, I can't go home with three matzahs. My father said I should take six. He said, six? What are you talking about? I made these matzahs. They're so precious. I, I could barely give out three to each person so they have for this for the Seder. But I can't give you six. He said, look, let's keep it up. Hey, my father said I can't come home unless you give me six. He said, well, your father's a big tzaddik. Okay, I'm going to give you six. Now listen to this. He goes home and heir of Pesach, a few hours before Yodif, he comes back to the Skolena Rebbe and he gives him back three matzahs. The Skolena Rebbe says, what is this? You're making jokes? I didn't want to give you six. I gave you six. You're bringing me back three? Listen to what he said. He said, you know what my father said? My father knew that you're going to give away the best matzahs to everybody else. And you're just going to have those that are barely kosher for yourself. But he knew you were going to give me the best ones. So he made me take three extra ones so I could give you back three before Yomtev. And you'll have three of the best matzahs that you would have given to other people. And you know something? The son and the gabai today told me that was the matzahs. Those were the matzahs he used. Who thinks like that? 
powerful great story. people are thinking powerful. about other people. Powerful, powerful story. That's the answer for Pesach. That's what it's all about. Wow. So do you, you would like open, open the Seder with these stories to give over that yeah, idea. Right. Give it, give an idea, give an idea of, mm. I wouldn't say both stories in the beginning because then, you know, it's getting late, but I right. certainly would say one. And one for I, each I, night. I, I one say, for each night. I, if you listen to this before Shabbos, I mean, at, at the Shabbos table, tell them, this is what we're going to do this Yontif of Pesach. In other mm-hmm. words, introduce the Yontif that's coming as a Yontif of compassion, of Yontif of Rachmanes. Now, I'll tell you, one of the most brilliant people around is Rabbi Yisrael Meolau. I mean, I don't know if any of you ever heard him speak. He was a former chief rabbi of Israel. Amena went through a difficult, difficult youth, but the most eloquent speaker that you could possibly imagine. And when he was chief rabbi, you got to see this in the Haggadah. And this is one of the stories that I would tell at the Haggadah right in the beginning by Halach Ma'anya. Now, at the Seder of Israeli soldiers, that's what Rabbi Lau did. He gathered over 100 soldiers together. And when he was chief rabbi, he wanted to make a Seder for those soldiers. And he started by Halach Ma'anya. And the proper way to do it is not only by saying the Aramaic or the Hebrew words, but to translate. And he translated the words. And I just want to read you what he said. And we all say this, the last two lines in Halachma. It says like this. Hashat HaHocha, this year we're here. L'shon Haba Ba'ar the Yisrael, next year we'll be in Israel. Hashat Avde, this year we're servants and slaves. L'shon Haba B'nei Chorin, next year we'll be free. Now there was one Israeli soldier who was out to ask a difficult question it's not so much even that he wanted an answer, but he was, he was a troublemaker. And he said to Rabbi Lau, in front of everybody, right after Rabbi Rao led this, he said, Rabbi, I don't understand what the Haggadah is saying. It's saying that this year I'm here, next year I'll be in Israel. I'm in Israel now. It says this year I'm a slave, next year I'll be free. I'm free. I'm free and I'm in Israel. So the Haggadah is not talking to me. So if the Haggadah in the beginning is not talking to me, why should I read the rest of it? Hmm. Yeah. That's a strong question. But to ask a question right at the <laughs> beginning of the Seder. Right. Everybody was quiet. What is Rabbi Lau going to say? Now listen to this brilliance. Rabbi Lau wasn't phased, and he said like this. He said, young man, I want to tell you something. Over the course of my life, I have had the opportunity to daven on Yom Kippur next to the greatest rabbis, Rabbi Shach, and Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Orbach, and I watched how they said al hate and al shamdo and they were crying. Why were they crying? They never did those Haveras. They didn't even think of doing those sins. The answer is they were davening for those Jews who did sin. He said, I saw how they cried when they heard that Israeli soldiers died. He said, you see, at Har Sinai, we were all one. When we got to Torah and we left Mitzrayim, we were all one. See, you're lucky. You're in Israel, and you're, in a sense, free, but not free, as I'll show you in a moment. But there are millions of Jews out there who are not in Israel, and they would love to be where you are. So just like Rav Shach, when he said, Oshamno, we sinned, he's not talking about himself. He's talking about the other Jews. And when we say, Holachma, you, my friend, are talking about all the Jews in Spain, in Canada, in England, the United States, they would love to be in Israel. That's what you're saying. You're not talking about yourself. You're talking about all the Jews. And freedom? Are you going to tell me you're free? You don't have passions. You don't have distractions. You don't have addictions. You don't have all those things that hold you back from serving Hashem with Torah and mitzvahs. We're not free. When Mashiach comes, we won't have all these distractions. That's what we're saying. This Mm -hmm. year, we're servants because of everything, all the surroundings that curtail us from coming close to Hashem. When Mashiach comes, and we'll all be in Eretz Yisrael together, we're not going to have those distractions. That's what the Allah Ma'anya is all about. And wow. everybody saw I feel like even this year, it's, it's even, you can add even like more to that. Of fact that course. We're definitely not, you know, with everything going on in Eretz Yisrael. Of course, of course. So even in Eretz Yisrael, you're not free today. Look at all the bombs and, and missiles right. and, and drones that, came just last night from when we were making this recording. Right, right. 
So that's all of a sudden that gives you a different perspective of what halachma you're talking not only about yourself, you're talking about Klal Yisrael. You're davening for Klal Yisrael. Now, I want to tell you one of the most painful stories. And I don't know that every father or mother will be able to tell this story without crying. But I'll tell you something. There's nothing wrong if you cry when you tell this story. Because you're going to bring out a great lesson. You see, I wrote a Haggadah a couple of years ago. And I hope that you'll all be able to get it. I'll just show it to you. It's called At the Magid Seder. I could say that for someone who's been going through it, it's it's incredible. It's uh, really incredible. Now, the last page of this Haggadah, I have the following story. It's about a father and a son who the night of the Seder were in Auschwitz. And the father was very gaunt and very pale and frail. And, of course, he didn't have a Haggadah. And he was sitting with his little boy. And he said, you know, tonight is the Seder. Let me tell you as much of the Haggadah that I remember by heart. And he started Halachma. And then he said, my child, do you remember the Manishtana? And the little boy said, yes, I do. Abba, I do. He said, say it to me. And the little boy said the four questions. And the father was going to say, that's what the beginning of the answer is. And the little boy said, Abba, I've got a fifth question. He said, what is that? He said, Abba. Are you going to be here next year? And am I going to be around next year to ask you these questions? And tears came to the father's eyes. And he said, my child, nobody knows what tomorrow brings. Nobody knows what next year will be. But I do tell you this, without a doubt, next year, no matter where, there will always be children that will be asking their father for questions. Because that's Hashem's promise to the Jewish people. And that's why we say Yetzirah Mitzrayim in the morning in Shema. Boiker means morning when things are good. And we say Shema Yetzirah Mitzrayim at night when things are difficult. Because that's Hashem's promise. We're always going to be around. So my child, I don't know about next year, both of us. But definitely, there will always be Jewish children to ask their fathers. That's Hashem's guarantee to us. And that's what the story of Yetzirah Mitzrayim is. The Jews thought they were finished. It was over. How are they ever going to get out of here? Hundreds of years in Golas. Slavery. But you know something? Hashem saved them. How did the Jews get out of Spain? How did they get out of Portugal? How did they get out of Russia? How did they survive the Nazis? How are we doing it now with Hamas? We're going to make it. We're going to make it. There will always be Jewish children asking their father. And I say to you, all of your fathers and mothers listening, don't forget to kiss your children and tell them how much you love them. And don't forget when you're saying moidim, be grateful. Moidim means thank you. You know, it occurred to me once that the word moidim, mem vav dalagud mem, is equal 100. That's not a coincidence. Because you've got to be grateful for 100% of mm. the things that you have. You're sitting at a Seder with children and grandchildren, friends and family. As many as you have, they be grateful for everyone. Not everyone is able to do that. Even in Israel, this year at Pesach, many people are not in their homes that they were last year. Right. If you could be in your home, that's something to be grateful for. What, what age would you say that yeah, you could just that share that, that story with? Ten and older. Mm. I'll tell you this. There's a fellow in the West Hempstead, actually. His name is Ari Hirsch. So, sure. right? So he has this newspaper called Jewish Views. And yeah, he has yeah, sure. Different people that he interviews. So this year for the Pesach edition, he interviewed me. And one of the questions he asked, he said, what's your favorite bracha? Or what's your favorite part of the Seder? And I told him, you know what? One of my favorite or most meaningful parts of the Seder. And the truth is, Many times I can't even say it without crying. And that's the bracha of Shechiyonu. Shechiyonu v'kimonu v'kiyonu v'asman We've lived another year. We've come to another Seder with family and friends. Don't minimize it. Think about all those people who lost their lives in Israel. Think about the hostages. Think about so many different tragedies all over the world. And you're sitting at a Seder. 
Shechiano. That's something to be so grateful for. It's a, you can't it's even a talk about it without idea. crying. When you say yeah. Shechiano, tell the kids, look how grateful we have to be. We live in America. There is freedom. Okay, in America has a lot of anti-Semitism today, but we're going to manage. But look, tonight, we're at the Seder. Look at the beautiful table. Look at the beautiful cutlery. Everything. It's beautiful. Let's not forget. Very, very such beautiful. A, it's such a beautiful way to, to bring the message home. A lot of people are looking for ways to to bring, you know, the, the situation in Israel into our starim. And, you know, since October 7th, that's such a beautiful, you know, like a positive way right. to look at it and say, look, look, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, we're here. Baruch Hashem, you know, that we, that we made it. We made it to this Seder. Like, Baruch Hashem, we are here. And right. we, don't, we shouldn't let, you know, Hamas, Hamas would be being successful if they're taking down our Seder. We have to take our Seder and we have to elevate it and make it even more meaningful and even more, right. you know, impactful for, for our children. Right. No question about it. I, I, as a matter of fact, there's a fabulous story that uh, I would like to share. I just want to check, uh, you know, just the names, just, just the most beautiful story. You know, every Seder has beautiful Seder plates. I heard this beautiful story. There's a fellow in Teaneck today. His name is Heshi Marks. And he has a Seder plate that belonged to his, um, one of his ancestors in Germany. And what happened was his name was Rab Usher Marks. He lived in Darmstadt in Germany, and uh, they take great pride in telling this story. You see, before Kristallnacht, which happened in 1938, and that was when Nebuch, the Nazis, smashed and broke so many shuls, and so many Yidden were killed and sent away from Germany and now to concentration camps. But there was a fellow, his name was Joseph Marx. This young man in um, Teaneck, Heshi Marx, that was his grandfather. And somehow he was very good with the German Goyim, and they had done business together. And they told his wife that Kristallnacht is coming. And if she could get visas for the family and her husband, because her husband was so good, they'll be able to get out. And soon it spread that the Marx family was going to be able to leave Germany. And they were planning to get to New York. And people started giving them some of their most treasured possessions. Candlesticks, silver plates, estric boxes, summer boxes, whatever they could. Because they knew that they would be able to get out safely. And they said, here, we're writing down our name on it. And... When you come to New York, just hold it, and one day we'll meet you there and get it back. And they all trusted him, of course. He was able to get out to England, and he was in England for two years, and he took us everything that he had with him, and he finally brought it to America. And when he came to America, he lived in Washington Heights, and once he settled, he took an ad in the Jewish newspapers that he had many things from many different people in Germany. And if anybody could come and claim and take it, then they would be able, of course, to get it. They just had to prove that this was part of their family members. Wow, that's Every amazing. single thing was able to return to was able to be returned to family wow. members except yeah. one silver plate. No matter who he asked and who he advertised and how he described it, nobody could could nobody claimed it. And he didn't know what to do. Listen to this. And he went to Rabbi Breuer and he said, what should I do? I don't want to hold on to this plate because it's not mine. I'd love to give it back. But as much as I advertise, nobody knows whose it is. Listen to the genius of what Rabbi Breuer said. He said, I want you to hold it. And when it comes the night of Pesach, put that on your Seder plate. And put the moror in that little silver plate. And when you point to the Mara, just remember that that Mara on that silver plate symbolizes the Tsaurus that we had in the past and the gratitude that you now have, that you're able to have a Seder with this plate and the Mara on it. And it shows, Baruch Hashem, your family was saved. Mm -hmm. 
And this has been passed on from generation to generation. And Heshi Marks in um, Teaneck uses that silver plate on his Seder plate where he puts in the Mara, which symbolizes wow. the past and symbolizes the fact that their family was saved. That's incredible. That's wow. wow. This is so beautiful. And when you. At what point would you give that over that type of story? So, that you, would you I, again, bef- when you take the carpas and you're taking it off the Seder plate, say, my dear children, let me tell you a story about a Seder plate mm. before we do the carpas. Beautiful. Beautiful. So let's, uh, should we, should we transition into the, into the parts of Magid or should we yes. go to? Well, let me tell you one thing that I heard you got to have everybody tell this over. This is just so crazy. I mean, I shouldn't say crazy, but it's just unbelievable. Somebody told me this. And um, what is the first word that we say after the child asks the question? We say, Avodim Hayino, right? Avodim. Now, somebody told me, I mean, you're not going to believe this. Avadim has the letters, David ben Yishai Avdecha Meshichecha. Did you believe that? Wow. Look at that. Write it down. Avadim, you won't believe it. That's the letters, David ben Yishai Avdecha Meshichecha. Now, the reason that I'm telling it to you is because there's a great symbolism in that, I think. And, and what that is, is as follows. You see, Many times something will happen so bad and you think that's the end. But the Geula and the redemption is hidden right in there. So here is Avodim. We're slaves, right? But the Balagot is telling you, it's true, you might be slaves, but you're going to be redeemed. And you see it in the first word that the father is saying to the child. Avodim is David ben Yishai of the Chomishichecha. So I, I want to tell you a story that I spoke to the guy himself who this happened to. It, it, it's just crazy. And um, he didn't want, I should mention his name, as you'll see in a second, why he didn't want to mention his name. But I could just tell you that he was uh, one of the founders of the Shara Shemayim Sephardic Show in St. Louis. And he was once crossing the street, coming home from Davening, and he was hit by a car. and never. His body flew and he needed numerous operations and he had to have all kinds of he had steel plates put in his body and screws in the knee joints. And every time he traveled, because he was a businessman, it was always such a pain because when he went through security, his whole body rang up because of all the steel plates and, mm-hmm. and the screws. And it was terrible. And there was nothing he could do because he couldn't see it from the outside. And he, you know, wanted to know if he was carrying a gun or a knife. Like, why, why did this happen? Now, he told me the story himself that it happened. It, it's, uh, it's really unbelievable. So what happened was, and you could look it up, on May 23 and 2004, he was in the De Gaulle Airport in France. Now, at that point, they had added a new section to the airports, the main airport in, in Paris. And he was going through security, and he was stopped. And everybody, he saw everybody going ahead of him, and But he was stopped because of these screws and steel plates. 25 feet in front of him, as those people that he was just walking with, somehow this new wing in the airport, the ceiling came crushing down and killed. How many people? I think 15 people were killed uh, just 20 feet ahead of him. Tons of concrete had fallen. And why was he saved? Because he had those steels and those screws. So when he had that accident, he could have thought, and he probably did thought, Hashem, what are you doing to me? Avodim. Yeah, that's slaves, right? David ben Yishav, the Chomishichacha. I'm doing this to you so that you should be saved someday, except you can't realize that. And that's wow, something. That's all, it's also a beautiful message that you can give over by Yachatz, where we, you know, Yachatz, the idea about, you know, you, you have the, the, the first part, which represents the Shibud, and then the end, which represents, you know, the, the Cheros. And the, the message of things not really working out. Right. And then eventually and they do work out. And you <laughs> think it's finished. You think it's over. And, mm-hmm. and that, that's, that's the beauty of it. So, so many, 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 many times. And this happens in Shidducham. And this is a father or a mother can say this to a girl who's sitting at the table who's gone out numerous times and it didn't work out. 
that's the best thing that ever happened to you because, uh, you know, it's, uh, the right one will come along, Mitz Hashem. And right. sometimes, you know, a person feels like, why are they going through all this? But the point is that just Hashem is saving the right one for the right time. 100%. 100%. Wow, very nice. I'll tell you an amazing story. Again, you, you know me by now. And um, if I hear a story, especially a very moving story, and the person is still alive, of course, I try to uh, speak to the person. And I spoke to the person who this story happened to. It's just so incredible. The, later on in the uh, Haggadah, when we come to Vayemoru Es Chayeim, Hashem, uh, you know, th- th- you saw that the lives of Kla Yisrael, you know, were embittered. So this fellow, a number of years ago, I gave him a name. This is not his name. Of course, he didn't want his name mentioned, so let's call him Mr. Blau. And he told his rabbi that he wanted to uh, donate a Sefer Torah. Now, he wasn't a wealthy guy. A Sefer Torah cost $35,000, $40,000, and he was saving for many, many years. He never told anybody that he was saving. And um, what happened was that he finally had the money after many, many years. And he said to his rabbi, call the sofa. He's been writing it for many years already. And I'm ready to deliver it, you know, to bring it to the shul. And, um, of course, they had a big hachnas to say for Torah. They had it under a chuppah. It was very, very beautiful. And people kept asking him why he wants to give the Sefer Torah. At the beginning, he, he didn't want to tell anyone. But finally, he told somebody in the shul. And that person called me, which I'm very grateful sometimes when People hear a great story, you know, they'll call me and I, I call the guy. And he said, uh, he said to me, he said, Rabbi, don't make me relive what I want to tell you. I said, look, you know, I'm not going to force you, but I'm just telling you that if a man gave a safer terror, there's got to be an inspirational reason. So he said, I'll tell you what happened. He said, I was in the concentration camps and I was a kid. I I didn't have anything from my parents. All I had was a pair of shoes. That was they gave me a pair of boots, and I had no pictures. I had no memories, nothing. And every night I would sleep with those shoes because that was my only connection to my parents. And one night, one of the Nazis came in there, the SS men, and he saw those boots that I was wearing. Nobody was wearing boots in the barracks at night. And he grabbed them off me and he said, these are now mine. He said, I cried all night because that was the last thing that I had. And the next morning I had no shoes. And I went outside to the lineup and I saw that soldier. And I said, please, please give me a pair of shoes. I can't, you know, I know you're not going to give me back the boots, but give me something. He said, sit down on a sidewalk here. I'll bring you something. He brought me a pair of shoes. He tells me this. I put my foot in the shoe. I could not believe it. The sole, the inside sole of the shoe was made out of the parchment of a Sefer Torah. Mm. They had taken a Sefer Torah, cut it up, and put that in shoes. And that's what I was stepping on. And those were the shoes. I I broke my heart every day I was stepping on Hashem's Torah. And I promised myself, if I ever get out of this alive, one day I'm going to make it up to Hashem and I'm going to give a Sefer Torah to Yeshua. And that's why he gave the Sefer Torah. Did you wow. wow. So, so what, what part of the Seder would you, would you so connect by to? As chayehem, the, that part when, by the Mora, when it says Hashem, you know, saw that uh, they embittered our lives. Well, look what this guy did with the time that he was so embittered and so distraught, but he did something incredible with it. Not everybody wow. can do that, but that's that's a simple balabas. You know, we're not talking about a great Talmud Chachamir. We're not talking about right. a great rabbi, but just somebody with a great heart. That's wow, 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 wow. It's a beautiful, beautiful message. It's a really nice message to give over to children that right. look how you can turn things around. That's look how you right. can really take That's right. your no suffering and you that. can turn it into such a positive, positive thing. Right now. What, you know, yeah. to transition us into the, to the Sipur Yetzias Mitzrayim, 
how would you give over any stories you would give over in terms of the Seaport ETS Mitzrayim to help, you know, make that more something, you know, that, 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 that our children can really feel, you know, the, fulfill the Rambam's lotion of, li, li, you know, Liros, not just Liros, but like Lihiros, like to really, really see ourselves as if we are leaving. I deal with this every year. I, you know, I think about that. Like, what in the world can we do now? The Sephardic families, you know, they walk around the table and they carry like a knapsack on their back. And, you know, so they're reliving that. You know, we as Ashkenazim, you know, don't have that custom. But right. I think it's just a question, especially today, if you could just um, picture October 7th, the families that live down south and now have, were displaced, and even the families up north that were displaced from their home, tens of thousands of people are not in their own home. And when you think about them, and we, could, and we see the pictures of these people that are living in strange homes and strange places, and it's very difficult for the kids. They have to go to new schools, make new friends. And again, I'm saying this for the parents. You don't have to tell it to the kids. A lot of these kids need therapy because they're adjusting to new areas and, and new surroundings. It's very, very difficult. So mm-hmm. when we just even open the paper or just hear what's going on in Eretz Yisrael, we could feel what it means, you know, to be in a strange country, even though they're in Eretz Yisrael, but they're in strange homes and they've got to start all over again. And if we could just try to picture that. And I'll tell you something amazing that I heard from about someone in the five towns. I don't know who it is, but he bought an apartment before October 7th, three floors in some area in Yerushalayim. And when he heard that so many people were displaced, he gave two out of the three floors in his brand new apartment building. Um, you know, he had three floors in that uh, building. Two out of three he gave to those people that were displaced mm. without charging them. Wow. I mean, that's... Wow. I mean, that's unbelievable that the person should have that feeling and that stalker to give from his own house that he didn't even move in yet. Now, probably for there, he'll be there for Pesach, you know, on that one floor. But to live with strangers and, and to give up straight, that, that's, that's, you know, me, Kaam Yisrael. I just want to tell a very clever story that happened with the Beis Halevi that uh, somebody had come to ask him a Shiloh and they wanted to know they said they didn't have wine and they wanted to know if they could use milk for the dollar kaisais. So the Rav said, you know, I'll give you money for wine, but he gave him much more money than for wine. And the Rebetzin, when the guy left, said, you know, he said he didn't have wine. Why did he give him so much money? So he said, it's obvious that he didn't have money for meat also. She said, how do you know that? He said, because two of the kaisais are after benching. And if he had meat during the meal, he wouldn't be able to drink the milk. So if he wanted mm-hmm. to know that if he could use milk for Arba Kaisis, that means he was going to use milk after Berchaz Amazon. That means he couldn't have been Fleishik. So he didn't have money for, for meat. So, of course, he gave him for meat as well. And the reason mm-hmm. that I like to tell this story is because, I mean, you know, the older people or the older children may have heard it, but it's very clever, you know, how the Beis Halevi was thinking. And I thought that that was, you know, a, a cute story to tell over. Um, would you would you connect it? Uh, would you say at a specific part of the seder? I mean, it, it um, connects to what you're saying earlier. By by the second case, I wouldn't tell all the stories in the beginning, but by the second case, after you're drinking, uh, you know, before you wash, you say, you know, we have uh, wine, and you know, the story about the milk because we're going to eat a meal soon. We're going to have flashes, but you know, right. not everybody was able to have that all the time. Nice, that's very nice. Uh, very I, I, and I'll tell you in the Haggadah. And um, I would fax it to you, or not fax it to you, you know, uh, send you an email with it. Feel I want to tell you a, a tremendous thing that, again, um, is something that I bring out at every Seder now. And when I go to my Donik with the concentration camps, when I go to Poland, I tell people this thing that happened in the concentration camp. That there was a fellow, Rab um, Yisachar Davids. He was the chief rabbi of Rotterdam. And Nebuch, Nebuch, he and his family were sent to Bergen-Belsen with many, many other p- people of the community. And he wrote a tefillah. T- and I have, I saw the original, a copy of the original, and it's in the Haggadah. And he wrote a tefillah that people should say before they're going to eat chametz. 
And I have it both in Hebrew and in English. And I think that that's very important for parents to read to their children this tefillah. Now, not part of the Haggadah, read it during the meal. And just to bring out how grateful we are that we're able to eat matzah, we don't have to eat chametz, now that we can afford everything that we can afford. And these people, the tefillah is so moving. And the tefillah talks about how, you know, they want to be Makayim, the mitzvah of a chaybahem, to live and not to die. And, and the, the tefillah goes on to say, and because of our servitude, we find ourselves in a position that we have to eat the chametz, and we're just asking you, that you should please redeem us and save us and that we should be able to serve you, you know, next year in the, with the proper Seder. But the mere mm. fact that somebody would compose a tefillah like that is so beautiful and so meaningful. That's something we would never even think about. And yeah, what I, I do is that I make a copy of this tefillah and I give it out to everybody on the trip. I tell them laminate it and, you know, keep it at the Seder table. I will have to share with all the listeners. If you could send it to me, I'll, yeah, I'll you, definitely you, you could email it to anybody who wants. And, uh, you know, that would really be very, you know, something very special. Amazing. Amazing. So we have, we have stories so far about, you know, we have, we have the Dal, Dal Kosos, the, the Rachmanos, the, the Karpas, the, we, a little bit of Yachats and the, you know, a couple of different, like any, any other parts of either Magid or would you say, I'll tell you a adorable secret. story. I'll tell you a adorable sure. story. And, you know, because th this happens at every state, as you'll see in a second. I mean, all our Haggadahs are filled with wine, right? And the Kittel <laughs> or whatever. So um, there was a uh, Rav Hutner, uh, Yitzchak Hutner was the Rashi of Chaim Berlin. And he was, he could be very tough. And he could give strong answers, you know, to questions and whatever. So it happened once that... Um, by the second case, this happened by the second case, you know, they were pouring before Manishtana and the Talmud that was um, sp pouring the wine got some of the wine on the Rebbe's kittel. And he was so humiliated. And he knew the Rebbe was going to say something. There was no way that this Rebbe, Rafuta was going to let that slide by without saying something. And the Rebbe said something so incredible. He said, a kittel without wine is like a Yom Kippur Mahsa without tears. Mm. Mm. And that is so great. You know, he saved the kid from embarrassment, like these things happen, but it's all part of it. And it's a great story to have prepared with you, like in case that happens to you, it's a great right. story to just you know, whip out. <laughs> that's right. And and it is true. Well, what's a Yom Kippur Mahsa without tears, right? You know, so you yeah. know, it shows it's us true. what Yom Kippur is and it shows us you know, the cleverness of the Rebbe, and, you know, that's why I love that story. Now, I want to tell you a story that happened exactly where I'm sitting right now. I'm sitting right now here. So many, many years ago, at this table, I had this host to have a Seder with my children and grandchildren. Now, the one that I'm telling you the story about, my grandson, I'm from Zelik. Today, he's a father. He's living in Eretz Yisrael. Baruch Hashem, he just came in with his wife and kids. But he was three or four years old at most when this story happened. And what happened was, just as I'm sitting right here and we're about to say Behisha Amda, and this is a story to tell by Behisha Amda, that he comes in, you know, he's running from the kitchen, dining room, living room, you know, no four-year-old can follow the Seder. And he comes up to me, he says, Zadie, can I sit on your lap? Now, Mitzvah Hashem, you'll all be Zadies and they're all bubbies. A kid asked you to sit on the lap. Well, that's a question, of course. So I picked up the case in my right hand and I picked up my little boy, my grandson, on my left lap and I'm holding him and we're singing Vahisha Amda. And we start saying Vahisha Amda. And suddenly I started crying. I couldn't look at anybody. And, you know, if you try to hold back the crying, you know, it gets even worse, right? So I just kept my head down. I didn't say anything. And I just sang as much as I could sing, you know, with the tears in my eyes. And we finished Rehisha Amda. I didn't want to talk about it. And we went on with the Seder. Now, the reason that I was crying was because I was saying these words. Not only one nation, in every generation. And I started thinking, what's going to happen when this kid gets bigger? 
and all the kids his age. It doesn't stop. We lost six million. We lost so many Israeli soldiers. It never stops. And that's what the Balagot is assuring us. And that's why, you know, I was crying. Mm. And I always tell the story that the next two days later, Cholomite, I did a bris out in Long Island, a place called Mount Sinai, of all places, 60 miles from where I am. And unfortunately, the uh, father was not Jewish. The mother was Jewish. And um, the grandparents wanted to have a bris. The baby's Jewish. The mother was Jewish. And I turned around. You would not believe this. Cholomai Pesach. I turned around and I saw the following thing. I wish I had a camera. I didn't have a camera on my phone. I didn't have a phone. There were no cell phones. You know, this was 30 years ago. I saw a box of Horowitz margaret and matzahs, a bowl of bagels, a cheese platter, and a meat platter. Every Avera you could think of. Bosa, Bosalo, Chomets, What in the world is it doing at this point? And the answer is because what does it mean? It's not only Hamas as we see now, but the assimilation. When we associate and we sing and play Goyesha music and dress as they do, and we acknowledge the way they talk and the way they think and the way they act, that's how this happened. How did Jennifer meet this guy, Napolitano? She met him at the workforce, she met him in college, she met him wherever. When Yidin don't make a machitza, they have to be so careful because we live in Golas. And never, that's what the Balagod is talking about. It's not only physical force that they're trying to kill us, but look at the assimilation in America. It's almost 70%, sometimes people say even more. That's horrible. So we must, mm-hmm. as fathers and mothers, must give our children a tremendous pride in Yiddishkeit. Make them feel that Yiddishkeit is fun. Shabbos is not a time when you can't do this and you can't do that. Shabbos is a time when we get together, we could sing together and play games together and talk around the table together and, and be warm with each other and invite friends and make a Shabbos table a great place to be, not a place of criticism. And when kids want to be home, you know, Rav Matasio Salman once said something very interesting. He said, you know, if you criticize children too much at the table, they're not dropouts, they're pushouts. Mm. It's a very good word. Wow, that's that's sharp. That's what I'm saying to parents. Don't tell this to your kids that they're pushouts, but just be careful. You want to build your children. You don't want to break them. And you build your children by preparing for the Seder, by preparing for the Parsha. You know, I'm not saying it's easy, but today with TorahAnytime.com and so much of the technology that's available and all the shuls, all the newspapers, everything that's given out, you'll find something, but you're the one that should tell them what the Parsha is about. Not that they should tell you a gematria, that's not a Vartoira. Or they're reading something, you know, that's... uh. Uh, you know, that's not, you know, the saying that I tell you what the Rebbe said. You should, you should be guiding them and you should be telling them what the Parsha is about. You should be telling them what the Haggadah is about. And as we said before, it's preparation. It's preparation. Now, I 100%. want to give all of you a bracha. Every single one of you, including you, Rabbi Yemenchel. I don't know if you're old enough for this. I know you can't imagine. What am I going to say that you're not old enough, right? <laughs> okay. I want to tell you one of the greatest things in my life. And it happens every Thursday night at 1030. What I have is a Zadie conference call. That means that all my children and all my grandchildren, they all get on the phone at 1030. I've heard about the famous, you know, the conference call. I've heard about this. And uh, what I do is I prepare for this again. It's all preparation. It's not just Tom, how you doing? You know, if you don't prepare, there's nothing to talk about. So I have on this spiral notebook that I made the notes for what I wanted to say to all of you tonight, I have a Zadie conference page. And if I hear something from my Rebbe Rob David Cohen that's interesting, I'll write it down. If I hear a new story, I'll write it down. Write it down so that I can tell it to them. And when you have this connection, you come to my house or you're with me on Friday, they're all calling to say good Shabbos. 
because they were all on the phone last night and some of them, in, you know, uh, interact, some don't, whatever, you know, people are a little bit embarrassed and it's never on Zoom, never, because then everybody has to get dressed. It's only on audio. It's on the phone. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody could be the way they are, whatever. It's some theory. It's late at night. And, but then there's a connection. And when you have a connection with your kids and grandchildren, there's nothing better than that. You're a millionaire. hundred percent. I'm curious, you know, you have Baruch Hashem, it's known that you have a lot of children, a lot of grandchildren. How did you, over the years, you know, at, at your own storm, I guess, as your children were growing up and even now when you have, you know, children and grandchildren coming, how do you talk to all the different ages? How do you, you know, cater, cater the, me- the messages, the stories, all the different things to, to all the different ages? So that's a good question. And I'll tell you something very interesting that my wife, more than I, decided this, that as our children got old enough to make their own Siddharam, we went to them. Now, I never in my life thought that I would do that. I always pictured a Seder, the Sadie sitting up front and <laughs> children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. But that's not necessarily the best because you want your children to be able to do what you did, right? You spoke to your children, mm. but if they're sitting at your table, then you sit, they're not interacting with their children. Now, right. one year we did this. Everybody ate the meal together, but everybody had their own table where they sat with their own children. You know, mm, on paper, it sounds good. It, it doesn't really. Like <laughs> sounds, sounds like, <laughs> sounds like a lot. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a hotel. You know, where everybody's <laughs> got their own room. But, um, yeah. you know, there comes a time when you have to go to them. And, uh, you know, you, I, my wife speaks to my daughters and daughters-in-law almost every single day. And it's a mm. constant thing. It's not a one-time thing. It's not that you could just sit down and, you know, start a whole conversation. It, it's, it's a constant right. thing. And when you're, what, what was it like when your children, your children were growing up, meaning when they were growing up and you had a lot of different ages and a lot yeah. of, so, you, know, you, I, 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 you have a lot of things, children. I'll tell you what I did with them. We used to play ball all the time. I I was a big ball player and I believed very strongly in sports, especially my daughters as well. My daughter's a basketball coach, another was a soccer coach or whatever. Mm -hmm. And one daughter could not play ball to save her life, but she was a fabulous cook. And her name was Elisheva. So we stopped calling her Elisheva. We called her Elisheva because she was the (laughs) chef in the house. And she is the most fabulous cook and baker today because we honed in on a talent that she had and, and went with it. You know, just because right. I'm a big believer in, in sports and I believe that when kids are good in sports, they'll be good at anything else as they get older because they get a, a feeling of confidence. But sure. if, if she was not that, so do something that, you know, she's good at. And how, and how did you balance all their different, you know, because how, exactly. how many children, how many children do you have? So like you have different ages and, right. you know, so I'll tell you what I do. How did you, how you, what you what I, them at this and I always talk about this. Every child, every week had 20 to 30 minutes undivided attention. We'd go for a walk. You want to play basketball. You want to go bowling. You want to learn Ezra. You want to do exercise, whatever, just me and you. And now when I, when these kids were growing up, there were no cell phones. But even if I would have had a cell phone, just shut it off. I'm asking all the parents, when was the last time you had a real conversation with your child? A real conversation. Then how was school? What'd you get on the, what'd you get right? What'd you get wrong? That's not a conversation. A real conversation like you have with friends. Today, we don't even have conversations. Everything is texting. But the point is really to talk and, and to play with the kids. And play basketball. And people ask me, how do you do this? Every week you're in a different city, a different country. All the kids are married. You got to be crazy to do this kind of stuff if your kids are home. So we had a basketball court in the backyard. I'm, <laughs> I'm laughing because Right next to my house. Okay, now the Jewish people that live there, the Flanagans live there. And when Richard Flanagan and, and, and Megan Flanagan, you know, we all play basketball together, they would call me Tati. They thought that was my <laughs> Imagine Richard Flanagan's calling me Tati. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Thank you so much oh, for providing so many incredible stories and incredible ideas, incredible insights into, into how you yourself have, you know, given over over the years different different ways of, of, you know, giving over that inspiration and that meaning. And I'm, I have no doubt that everyone who listens is going to really I take these so. stories. I, I myself, so. I look forward to using these stories and, uh, and uh, it's really, really incredible. Just, I'm going to tell you a fabulous story and every family should tell uh, this story to their children 
because this is amazing. And you could look it up online. You'll see the story as well. You know, when we say Hallel, so that's already after benching. And we use a very express, a very interesting expression. David Amal says, Hashem God's name should be blessed from now until forever. So every father, every mother, every child, every Jew has the opportunity to be a Makadashim Shemayim. You never know when it's going to happen. But the way you drive, the way you act on the plane, the way you shop, the way you cross the street, the way you drive, every, people know you're Jewish. There's no way of hiding it. Snood, no snood, white hat, black hat, small yarmulke, big yarmulke, you can't hide it. Golf cat, whatever. We look Jewish, finished. And because you look Jewish, you don't represent only your community. You represent all of Israel, especially today. So we have a tremendous surprise. So listen to this story that happened uh, a number of years ago. And it's, it was in 2013. And there was a guy, his name was Noah Murov. He lived in New Haven, Connecticut. And he is a young married man. I think he was a Rebbe in Yeshiva. And uh, he wanted to buy a desk for his study. They had just moved into a new home. So he looked up some ads and there was this Goyish woman, Patty, that was selling a desk. And um, he called her up and she gave him the size and he, they agreed on a price, whatever, a couple hundred dollars. And uh, he said he would bring a van and he went to pick up the desk with his friend. Now, they got the desk and they brought it into the van and they brought it into the front of the house. But when it came to bring it into his study, the door to his study was much more narrow than the front door. He couldn't get it into his study. So they had to take it apart. And he just bought this desk. It wasn't a new desk, but. He had to take it apart, and then he would be able to put it into a study. Now, when he took it apart and he started taking out the drawers, he noticed a bag in the back that was stuffed with something. He opened up the bag, and there were hundreds and hundreds of $100 bills. Now, he counted it. It's hard to believe this, but there was $98,000 there. Now, he went crazy. and. He knew in a second, of course, he's, gonna, he's not going to keep it. He's going to call this woman, Patty. And, of course, he put the desk t- together and he called Patty and he said, you know, I know you're not going to believe this, but I just had to take apart the desk and I found all this money. And she said, oh, my God, I knew I was missing it. She said, I've had such a hard life lately. My parents, both my parents died. I'm living alone. I was so down, and my parents had left me a lot of money, and I hid it, and I hid it in different places, and I knew that I didn't remember all the places that I hid it. I thought I had everything, but I knew in my heart that there was someplace, but I couldn't figure out where it was. I can't believe that you're going to give it back to me. He says, what's the question? And he went back, and he went with his wife, and he took his kids as well. See, that's Chino. He took his kids to show the Kiddush Hashem that he gave back the money. And this woman, Patty, of course, she gave him back the money for the desk and she gave him $3,500. And she said, you know, most people wouldn't do what you did. But listen to this story. He came back home and he called his Rebbe, Rabbi Shmuel Kamenetsky. And he said, you know, should I tell this story to the newspapers, the Jewish newspapers? Because, you know, people, you know, it's, it's a nice story. People could learn from it. Rav Shmuel said, not only the Jewish newspapers, you have to call CNN, NBC. You have to call all the <laughs> secular shows and newspapers. Because there's so much negativism, negativism about Jews. Let them see what a Jew is all about. <laughs> and he was wow. on every TV show. He was on every newspaper. That's Yehisheh Hashem of Ayrach. Now, I met him. He's in Phoenix. Today. He's a Rebbe in Phoenix. And, of course, I interviewed him for the story, and I got permission, and of course, to use the name, and I sent him the story before I printed it, as I do anybody who I'm writing about. But the point is, here's a guy who made a kid of Shem Shemayim. Not everybody would have that opportunity, but we all have opportunity. 
That's the thing that parents have to give over. Yehi Shem Hashem Now, at MetLife Stadium, we had 95,000 people. And you know, the cops said they never saw anything like this. 95,000 people singing and dancing, and not one of them was drunk. That's what one cop said. Hmm. And you know, I'll tell you, somebody told me that a cop told him, he said he was talking to a fellow officer, and the fellow officer said, you know, I wish I could be Jewish. And he said, why? He said, look at these people. What are they celebrating? People celebrate all kinds. They're celebrating that they studied a page of Talmud and they understand it. What kind of noble people is that? And listen to the comment that he said. He said, I think they made a mistake yesterday. They called a giant stadium, but it was a stadium of giants. Isn't that great? Wow. And that's what you got to tell your kids. They could all be giants. Amazing. Be jet fans, Amazing. but they got to be giants. <laughs> <laughs> amazing 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 thank you so much that's, really that's appreciate your time it. and and giving us this inspiration i mean i know for myself i'm so excited to give over these stories to my children at this you know this year and uh to make this part of part of our seder to really to really increase the meaning and the impact thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the jews next door i hope you enjoyed as much as i did i'd love to hear your takeaways reach out to us reach out to me at yair at jenoff.org hi at jenoff.org you can check us out on the website you could leave a question there we'd love to be in touch please be in touch check us out on instagram at parenting the jews next door hit me up on twitter at yair manchel and we got, we're on TikTok now too. We have some great content, a lot of really great insights into parenting, tips, parenting pointers, reaction videos, and quotes. We have a lot going on. We have a lot of articles. You want to check it out. Check it out at jenoff.org. You won't be sorry you did. And I look forward to hearing from you. And if you haven't yet subscribed to the podcast, make sure you subscribe and share it with your family and friends. Looking forward to another great episode next week. <laughs>